assumptions and beliefs we carry, assumptions about, you know, who is good, who is bad. There's this, there's this particularly limiting thing called a, which I called a victim mindset. You know, we all go through situations where thing do, things don't work out the way we like. And there are some of us who immediately look to somebody else to blame. Oh, it's my mother, my teacher, my boss. It's the stars. Shani is in the wrong house this, this time. Something. Well, it's not helpful to have these uh, ideas. You know, successful people, if you're going to be effective, you have to say, well, it happened. Now, what can I do to clean up and, and you know, improve things? This is called agency. So the main point here is, it took me 50 years to wake up to this, that our life is basically the set of beliefs we have, and if you change the belief, your reality changes. And I've also given examples on how I have consciously changed my belief system on a number of things. Next one. Okay, this one's really important. How many of you who are graduating want, are looking forward to a job? Hey, come on, stop pretending. It can't be so few. I know it's a great school, but... Okay, only a few of you. Good. The point is very simple. Jobs, employment, careers, these are artifacts of the 20th century. They are going to be relevant to fewer and fewer of us in this century. Why? Because there's no such thing as a stable job anymore. Why is that? Well, companies are going through such crazy times that they, you know, overnight a successful, well-run company can cease to exist. Earlier this year, three big banks, two in the U.S. and one in Switzerland, overnight went bankrupt. Only two of them, no, two of them were well-run, one of them was not so well-run. So big institutions today can disappear in the blink of an eye. Earlier this year, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft laid off tens of thousands of employees who were good employees, not the non-performers. So you can be in a great company doing a good job and your whole team can be out tomorrow. Why? Because the companies go through difficult times. And I call this musical chairs. You all know musical chairs? It's not a generational thing? Okay, good. It's so in, mu in musical chairs, when the music stops, you're out. Now what's happening is, we're pay playing this big game of musical chairs. There are only a few chairs, and there are a lot of us still there, and the music's stopping very fast. So sooner or later, it's just a matter of time before you're caught out. Okay? And then, particularly if you're above 50, life's tough. So the point is, the faster you can learn to become independent, self-employed, better yet an entrepreneur who's creating some jobs for someone, some other people, the better off you're going to be. It doesn't matter how old you are. You could be 55 today, you could be 25, you could be 15. The best time to start thinking in this way is now. And a job is still important, okay? But only as a starting point, as your launch pad for the rocket. Because the first job teaches you so many things. It teaches you discipline. It teaches you how to get along with other people. It teaches you some skills and you begin to then see where is their opportunity. So by all means, aspire to a good job, but quickly figure out how you're going to be independent. Okay? Next point. Next two. One more. The next thing, uh, yesterday I was walking around and I asked some of the students, what should we talk about? But most of them said AI. So I added, quickly added two points on AI. How do you succeed in an age of AI? Think of AI as a tide that is coming in on a very shallow beach. What happens in a shallow beach is the water rises very fast. Okay? And there are a lot of stones on this beach. So the AI tide is coming in and very quickly the rocks are getting covered. And the rocks are the things that we used to do as human beings. So more and more jobs can get automated. What are you supposed to do? So I said, let me get the conversation started by saying two things. The first thing is, you cannot run faster than AI. On the things that AI is good at, it learns at an exponential rate, and we humans learn at a 
fairly flat linear rate. So you cannot run faster. <clears throat> so the only way, only hope we have is by actually becoming more human, more uniquely human. Uh, I was having a breakfast conversation with Mary this morning. Now, what does it mean to be more human? And I, in my book, I talk about the four super skills which are uniquely human. One of them is interacting with other human beings. Okay, so communication, working together to solve something, do something, collaboration, teamwork, creativity, still very much a realm of human beings. As I was coming in yesterday to Kotem, I, I asked Chad GPT, uh, tell me a joke about two men who went fishing. And it came up with the worst thing. I mean, it wouldn't, it, even if you're drunk, you can't smile. It's so stupid. So creativity is still very much in the realm of human beings. Okay? So learn to get better at this. And again, Mary, our breakfast conversation is, I think that's a huge head start for this school. Because, it, you know, unlike many other schools which focus on test prep and hard skills like coding, I think the curriculum here is designed to encourage humanity. Okay? And I believe globally there's going to be a big swing back to studying and understanding the humanities. Because becoming more uniquely human is the only way we can compete with AI. So that's one of the super skills. The other super skill is entrepreneurship. Okay? The ability to build a business around some idea. It's going to be a long time before AI can do that. A third super skill is called learning agility. Learning agility is not just learning some new concept or learning a new poem or learning how to code in Python or something. Learning agility is the ability to adapt to a completely new situation. So think COVID. When COVID happened, all of us were shocked. None of us had ever lived through something like this. But different people adjusted differently. You know, some people got into a real mental health issues. They became depressed and, you know, anxious and fearful and all that. Others did okay. Some of us flourished and said, this is great. I don't have to go to work. I can work from home. Okay? So I, can, I don't have to go to school. So we coped with it in very different ways. So this capacity to deal with shocks is something we have to learn to do better. And the final super skill is leadership. The ability to inspire others to come join hands with you to tackle something is a uniquely human trait. None of us are going to follow a machine, at least for the next foreseeable future. So if you have leadership skills, you're priceless. Now the problem with these four super skills is generally they can't be taught in the classroom, they are not taught in schools, they are not taught in companies, you can't go online and learn it. You have to learn these things experientially and that too by taking on very difficult experiences. Okay? So repeatedly you have to put yourself outside your comfort zone by taking on something new and in that process you develop these skills. We can talk more about uh, how, what this means at any age. So that's one thing. The other thing I would say about this age of AI, you cannot be average. Me mediocrity will really doom you to a very bad existence, which is very different from my generation. <clears throat> my generation, you know, we had a fantastic thing going on. We had the internet happening for the first time. We had globalization happening for the first time. So people, goods, money could move across borders. And we had India opening up 35 years ago, okay, 30 years ago. As a result, it created huge opportunities for everybody, including very mediocre average people. You didn't have to be much. It studied a little bit, showed up, willing worker. You're going to be fine. Today, that is not the case, even today. So one of the shocking statistics about India, thanks a lot, is today a young person in India who has a higher education degree, which means what? BSc, BCom, some MBA, some engineering, is five times as likely to be unemployed as somebody who is illiterate. For anybody here who is above 50, this is shocking. For every teacher, this should be shocking. 
because we used to assume education is the pa a ticket to a better life. That is no longer the case because of the lack of job opportunities and with AI it's going to become more difficult. So if this is the case, what are you supposed to do? You have to be exceptional. Now you can say, look here, the word average means half the population is below average, half is above. How, how, how can everybody be exceptional? Okay, well you can be exceptional at something. What matters today is that you know what you're good at and you become excellent at that. And that could be anything, that could be music, maybe you're a musician. Well, become gifted, and you, you know, develop that so that you're exceptional. Somebody else is very good at writing, somebody else is very good at farming, cooking. It doesn't matter what it is, coding. You better be really good or else a person with a machine is going to displace you. AI may not displace you but somebody else with AI is going to displace you and therefore learn to use AI because you plus AI is greater than you, okay? That's why at any age it's important to start learning about this, using it as a tool and it's not that difficult, it's a psychological barrier. The last point, think not just about what you want to do but the kind of person you want to be. So if you move to the next slide, I have some photographs and I've deliberately put two generations of people. The top are younger people and the bottom are slightly older people. Do you recognize any of them? Who? Cool. Just give some names, shout out some names. Yeah. And who's on the top? Huh? Ashneer Grover, Bharat Pe. Baiju Ravindran, Elizabeth Holmes, Sam Bankman Freed. Okay, what's common to these people? Huh? They have ended their careers or soon to end their careers. Okay. What else is true about this group? Yeah, go ahead. They're successful. Great. So both are true. First of all, these are exceptional people. And they achieved exceptional success, not because their father or mother gave them a business, they built it, their success themselves. And second thing is, they're either in jail, just out of jail, or soon to go to jail. Okay? That's what's common to them. None of them started out in their career intending to do the things they did. They were just like you and I, except they were more ambitious. Okay? And this is a huge problem in the world today. Because there is so much psychological pressure on particularly young people but also older people to be seen as successful. Okay? You must do something absurd by the time you are 30 or else life is not worth it. Okay? Or you know, whatever. But you have, there's got to be this incredible success that you achieve at fairly quickly. And this is fanned and accelerated by social media. One of the po most important advices I give in my book is dump social media. If you're on Instagram, Facebook, all these things, pull the plug. It's just completely pernicious, cancerous. Okay? So what, what I say here is um, you need to think about also the kind of person you want to be. You do need to think about values. You do need to think about... I saw in many of the walls of the classroom the word character. It's a very old-fashioned term. Almost nobody thinks or talks about character anymore. But this is going to become more and more important as the world becomes more and more crazy. Now I'm going to quickly switch and then end, uh, open it up for questions to people like me, my age group, which I'm very fond of, people who I think broadly are 50 uh, and above. So what's the first thing? The first thing is this. For the longest time, because lifespan was short or shorter, we lived what is called a, a, a three-stage life. First stage is a, a learning, that's the first 20 years. Then the next 40 years, which is earning. And then there's five years, maybe 10 of retiring, and then it's gone. Now, if you're going to live to 90, it opens up a fantastic new possibility which is that middle period from say 50 to 75, okay? And this is today being called variously the third chapter, the second mountain, etc. 
And it is a glorious period, I believe. It's a golden age. Why do I say it's a golden age? Because some things have happened. First of all, relatively free. The kids have grown up. Hopefully you've made a little bit of money and saved something. Uh, some of us still have very aging parents to support, but you know that won't be for too long. So there's freedom for the first time. The second thing is you're much less stupid than you were. Okay? A little bit more wisdom has seeped into our lives. So this combination is beautiful. And you still have energy. Your body hasn't given up yet. Okay? So this is the period where you can do amazing things which you couldn't have imagined or you postponed. I'll do it later. Okay? So I certainly approach life that way. So I just turned 60. And I genuinely feel everything I've done in these 60 years has just been preparation for what I'm to do now and next. And contrast that with others who say, my best years are behind me. Okay, what do I have to look forward to? It's all in the mind. It's how we frame it, right? So I use that beautiful state quote by Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or whether you think you cannot, you're right. Both cases, you're right. Okay? So we all know people our age or much older. I know people in, my, you know, in their 90s who are still doing amazing things. My father-in-law was a teacher. At, he was a professor at IAM. And he used to teach till 90, and then his hearing went out. The problem with, with retirement is, if you're not purposeful, first you stop doing things, and then your mind turns negative, your mind turns on you, and then the body follows. Okay? So that's why John D. Rockefeller said, look, a, a man must die in the saddle. He said it many years ago. Today he'd say, a person must die in the saddle, woman too. So, that's the first point. The next one is finding meaning or giving meaning and purpose to your life. I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. Only two days matter. The day you were born and the day when you figure out why you were born. Okay? And there is no objective answer to that. We have to give meaning and purpose to life. Okay? Because the worst thing to do is just get up every day and not know what this is all about. It's a prescription for depression and for falling ill. Uh, I can get into how you go discovering purpose because not everybody is born with that sense of purpose. By the way, this is so easy in the first 50 years. In the first 50 years, society gives you that meaning and purpose. You have to, you have to study, you have to graduate, you have to get a job. You have to start a family, you have to make a success of yourself. That meaning and purpose is automatically given to you. It's only when you turn 45, 50, 55 that all this falls away. And now you have to figure out the answer to why am I here? What is my life going to be about? And Father, you have seen a lot of people who in the twilight of their life, the ones who are filled with regret are the ones who felt that they lived a life that didn't really matter to anyone. You know, very often I see that. So, let's not live that way. Third one, related to this, is this idea of a portfolio life. In the first decades of our professional life, we do one thing. Like George, as a journalist, a writer, you tend to do one thing. Or somebody else like me, I ran businesses, built businesses, just focus, 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 teacher. Come to school, teach, help people grow. What happens is, as you cross this magical 50 mark, there's an opportunity to say, look, I want to be more in control of my life. I want to be more in control of my time. I don't want to be on a schedule dictated by someone else. I want to choose who I, I am with, which you can't do if you're, you know, doing one thing in an institution. So the answer to this is what I call the portfolio life. You do not one thing, but gradually find three, four, five things, each of which gives you something. For instance, in my case, my portfolio. I still like to earn the money I need. I don't want to dip into my savings. I do that by working on one board, Hitachi, and they pay me something every year. That's good enough. 
It takes very little time. My main thing are the Energy Alliance and the entrepreneurship work. That, I love solving complex problems, so I enjoy learning. I get the satisfaction of solving this puzzle a little bit every, time, every month or so. And I get the satisfaction of seeing people's lives improve. And then I do things which are pure fun, you know, joy, like being here. I enjoy engaging with people, helping them, you know, think about their own potential, etc. Particularly young people. So you build a portfolio, which together gives you all that you want, and you do this in a very intentional way. Fourth one, very simple, very difficult. Learn to be happy. This was particularly challenging for me much of my life. And then, over the last decade, I really worked on it. The, I woke up one day about 40, of age 45 and I realized I had a theory of happiness which was completely flawed. My theory was, if I work really hard and I am really successful, people will you know, give me a lot of recognition and reward and I'll be happy. And I realized where that happened. It started happening in school. Every time I got good marks, the teacher smiled and my mother gave me a hug. Every time I didn't get good marks, there were frowns. So like an obedient dog, I tried to get good marks. Then I went to join a company. Every time I did some good work, boss was happy, gave you a raise, a promotion. Every time you didn't do it, you got a kick. So you, again, you're trained. Okay. So you get on this treadmill. The problem is, like an alcoholic, you need to drink more and more to get the same high. And one day you wake up and you say, man, how long can this continue? I'm no longer enjoying this. I'm no longer happy. So you need to find something else. So I spent 10 years uh, you know, reading about the literature from different religious faiths. I went through counseling to understand this issue of happiness. And I write a whole chapter in the book about this. Three or four things I learned. First of all, happiness has nothing to do with success or achievement or what you have in your life. You know, we all know people who have everything and are miserable. Their face is like this. We all equally know people who have nothing, but they're always smiling and will offer you a cup of tea. Okay? So it's an attitude. It's a psychologist called the synthetic. Synthetic means it's made, manufactured by our mind. And so the trick here is to control your thoughts. The second thing I learned painfully is the more you think about yourself, the more unhappy you're likely to be. The more you lose yourself, the more happy you are. You can see that a little bit. Sometimes you're, you're playing a game of tennis or something or on, a, on the field. Suddenly one hour passes and you're ex happy and excited because you didn't think about yourself. You raise a child. Okay, or you're a teacher, you lose yourself in that activity. You're not thinking about you. So you can only be happy if you forget about yourself. It's been a very good lesson for me. The third one is acceptance. And, you know, I, there was a beautiful moment for me when the shoe dropped. Irfan Khan, the actor, namesake and all these movies, Tiffin Box, he was dying, very young, cancer. And the person was interviewing, he said, how are you able to smile when you know you're going to die in two months? He said, well, I had hoped life would be different, but life has no obligation to give us what we expect. Okay? And then I put that with Dalai Lama who said, happiness comes from liking what we have rather than having what we like. Okay? So this is very hard for me. Because I used to think, yeah, I wish I were a big CEO of a big company like Satya Nadella at Microsoft. Okay? Why have I not become that? And I used to go a little crazy. And then I realized, look, life has not turned out too badly for me. So let's be grateful for that and enjoy that. So cultivating this acceptance is very, very important. And the final piece around happiness is relationships. You know? Loneliness is the biggest driver of unhappiness. And the more we are connected with each other, the happier we are. The final point, which I won't talk about, is as I turn 60, I've learned that you can't take health 
as a given. Until now, we could abuse the body, do crazy things, and it would be resilient and spring back. By now, it's less forgiving. And so you have to be more intentional about what you eat, how much you eat, when you eat, exercise, all these things. For those of you who are interested, there's a new term called biohacking. So Google biohacking, okay? Basically, scientists are figuring out that aging and death, time, chronological aging is inevitable because time moves on. But your body need not age or even die, okay? Cellular death can be avoided or certainly extended profoundly if you do certain things. So go and look at biohacking. It, uh, it's really beautiful. Let me end with the last slide. Next one, please. You know, I asked George, what's on people's minds? And he said, well, there's a sense that we want to still be relevant as we age. We still want to be significant. So I put out that cartoon. Okay? The truth is, the reality is, we are utterly insignificant in a cosmic scale. Okay? Paradoxically, we're also God. But let's just look at the human form and say, we are insignificant. Last week, there was an enormous scientific discovery. I don't know if people uh, caught it. But scientists announced they had discovered a very, very low frequency throbbing sound in the universe. And it is at less one billionth of one hertz frequency. And it is caused by supermassive black holes in gal at the center of galaxies, each with the mass of 10 billion suns colliding. Okay? Just think about what's happening out there. Where is our life? Where is Earth? Where is our life? And that puts our relevance in context. So, next one. This quote is for me the answer to all this. So Jim March, who was a famous teacher, professor, says, look, all these aspirations of important significance are illusions. Ultimately, what may matter is just two things. Learning to walk the earth gently and finding a way to leave the place more beautiful than we found it. So thank you. But I'm open to reactions, questions, anything, um, as long as principle will allow it. Sure. Yeah. I think everybody is waiting for to ask questions to you. And after hearing all, I'm still asking myself, what the heck should I do with my life? You know, you've got the answer to that. I, I hope you're not asking yourself that <laughs> for the sake of the school. <laughs> yeah, but I, we have to think, as you were saying, we have to change our mindset. We have to do so many things. We have to think totally differently about the kind of things that we are going to face. So, uh, thank you for the talk, first of all. Uh, second of all, you uh, spoke about the perfect storm, where you have multiple different factors affecting our future, uh, our future, basically. And you said we could use it to our own uh, good by taking out uh, opportunities for jobs. For example, you gave an example of uh, seeds coated with bacteria. But now something like seeds coated with bacteria is something which requires a very vast uh, amount of research and work that goes into just making that one seed. And as uh, students who would be just stepping into the uh, world of jobs, we wouldn't be able to e even imagine that amount of research. So what would be a solution to that? Well, I think it's a very good question. I think the most important thing is to be curious, remain curious, and follow your curiosity. Okay? So let's say you're interested in science. Okay? Like this conversation says, look, this is really interesting. I want to learn more about microbes. And then you're getting all this input from your parents and teachers. No, 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 no. You should go do this, go do that. You should be, have the courage to follow your curiosity and go deeper and deeper into it. Sooner or later, it will lead to these opportunities. Okay? So Venki Ramakrishnan um, won a Nobel Prize for something in biology in 2013 or so. And I'm ran into him at a lecture he gave in Bangalore. And he talks about the lonely journey of, us, of, of his, 
Um, he, you know, followed the scientific path. He also studied a very um, strange thing about enzymes and RNA. Everybody was studying DNA. He decided to study RNA. And for five years, he produced no papers at all in Cambridge, but he still remained with it and dug deeper and deeper. And then he did the work that gets a Nobel Prize. So I think whatever you're, you're curious about, don't remain superficial. Go deep, follow it, follow it, follow it. Sooner or later, you'll figure out what to do with your life. Okay? And I just gave that as one of a million examples out there. Right? So, as I said, if you're a musician, you can start working with uh, large language models to start composing music. Okay? Do whatever. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, with the onset of artificial intelligence, uh, many jobs are becoming redundant in the sense there is no uh, secure job as such. So, aren't we digging our own grave by giving too much importance to AI? Yeah, good question. Sir, uh, so the new education policy has been coming up and uh, our generation, like uh, the, passing, the batch that is passing out right now, we weren't brought up in a way that is suitable for the education policy. But we are being evaluated on the basis of such a policy, uh, probably for the rest of our lives. So how do you, uh, how do you wow. suggest that we adapt to that? Superb questions, both. So uh, on the first question, human beings have always been like this. Okay? So if you start with fire, um, the printing press, the steam engine, the, com com the computer, the internet, now AI. We keep inventing things <coughs> which are what are called dual use. They can be used for good, and they can be used for bad. So fire can be used to, as a weapon to burn down, to attack. Fire also keeps us warm, helps you cook things, does both. Okay? And knowing that, we keep driving more and more innovation, pro scientific progress, etc. When the steam engine was first invented, and I've written about this, I call AI uh, the steam engine moment. When the first steam engine was invented, it was early 1700. It was by a fellow called Newcomen. He tried to use, he, use it to pump water out of uh, coal mines in England. It was useless. It was very inefficient, noisy, and all that. Then James Watt comes along, invents a condenser, makes it efficient. Then now people start finding uses for it. So George Stevenson, you remember George Stevenson? He invented the steam engine locomotive and makes railways possible. Somebody else starts developing an automated spinning loom. The workers go crazy. They said, this is going to take away all our jobs. One spinning wheel machine with a steam engine can do the work of 100 human beings. So what they do is go smash the looms. That's called the Luddite movement. Well, un, you know, technology marches on. And eventually, the steam engine, the Industrial Revolution, created many more jobs, many more new opportunities which didn't exist. This is the march of progress. You can't set it back. Are we digging our own grave? If we dig our own grave, if we don't figure out how to use these technologies, to make human lives better. Every technology can be used to exploit, control, to enslave human beings, or they can be used to liberate, empower, augment human beings. One of the reasons why electricity was so brilliant is it was used largely to improve our lives. It wasn't used to control it. So with AI, we have a choice at this moment in time. Should we let just 10 companies around the world control it? Okay? Or should we find a way to regulate it so it becomes available to everyone? So these are important choices, but there is no question about stopping and going, putting it back. We have to just be intelligent and wise about using it well for the benefit of humanity. Your question is also brilliant because I think education, although it's called new education policy and has some advantages, and I studied it, um, I think is completely unprepared for the age of AI. As I said, with AI, it doesn't matter 
what exam you passed, okay? It, what marks you got makes no difference. The machine doesn't care. It cares what you're capable of, okay? And, it, and as I said, it, what matters more is that you are a full human being. So, I, to the best I can see in 24 hours of being here, this school is doing a better job of that than most others that I know of, okay? And so, I would say, don't worry about that. Focus on what I have said, okay? Ultimately, even now, you know, companies like Tata Consulting Services, Infosys, Google, they're no longer looking at which college did you go to? What marks did you get? They give you an aptitude test, and if you can pass that, you're in, okay? And then, as I said, it doesn't even matter whether you join Google or not, because sooner or later, you better learn to be on your own. So what matters today is less your pedigree, whether you went ICSC, CBSC, what scores and marks you get, that matters less. Who you are matters more. So don't worry. But our policy has yet to catch up with that. Thank you, sir. I have two questions to ask, Salmita. Now, you said in the first chapter, you said that we must see jobs as a series of projects. So my question is, wouldn't companies stop hiring people who want jobs if they never had a stable job or shifted jobs every now and then? What's the second one? Right. Now, you took a reference out of the book Sapiens, right? And it says that we each need a positive, compelling narrative to believe in, like religion. Why is that? <laughs> He's a like clean bold or something in cricket. But um, no, the first thing is, you know, I'll give you a story. Um, it was 2003. I'd spent 16 years uh, building diesel engines and I'd reached the top of that company and I got hired. I got an offer from Microsoft. I asked 10 people. I was excited but also scared. I was excited because of, you know, this is the new future, Microsoft, whatever. But I was scared of failing. So I asked my closest friends and mentors, and my mom said no, my wife said no. Nandan Nilakani said, don't do it, this is going to end badly. My friends, no, not one person said you should do it. Then I said, oh, when I turned 50, I was 40 then, which will I regret more? That I had a chance to do it and I was too scared, so I said no. Or I took it and I was fired for incompetence two years later. I said, let me go in there and take my chance. But I'll see my, this not as a career at Microsoft, but as a project. And who knows how long the project may last. It may last two years, it may last longer. That gave me a lot of relief. And it actually ended up being eight years. Now, in the last 13 years, I've taken the same idea. And I'm seeing my life, not as some career and all that. There was the Infosys project. It lasted seven years. Okay? There's a UNICEF project. It's five years. There's my game project, five years. Some of them are happening at the same time. So it's a way of thinking. Okay? Sometimes this whole thing could happen inside an organization. You may be with Google, but you're doing different things over the years. Okay? So it's a way of thinking. Did, did I answer your question? I'll talk more over after this. The uh, second thing is uh, Sapiens and Harari. One of the things that has bothered me so much in this last 10 years has, is why do intelligent people confronted with evidence not change their opinion? Okay? So this is particularly true in the realm of politics. You see, in my friend circle, within my own immediate family, we're all totally divided about whether India is going down a good path or a bad path. Okay? Totally divided. It's no longer safe to talk about it. So we start every meeting by saying, please, let's not talk about these subjects, because it will only tear us apart. But I ask myself, look, these are all intelligent people. There's not a fool in the room. Okay? They're highly educated, successful. We all look at the same data. 
but we come to completely different conclusions. And we can't change it when confronted with the data. So I've been looking at this issue, and I got the answer when I read Harari, Yuval Harari. He says human beings are not persuaded by facts and logic. Okay? That only reinforces a conclusion we've already reached. The conclusion we reach is based on the story. We like to believe stories. And he says, Father, religion, religious teachers across all religions have understood better than anybody else. Because whichever religion you look at, there isn't a lot of hard evidence. Okay? It's in a way a story, and we choose to buy into that story and follow it. And it's needed for our own sanity. We need to buy into something. So, politicians have understood this even better than religious teachers today. So the ones who succeed are those who tell the better story. Nobody is interested in the truth. Okay? So we have, so I say, hey, you young people, one of the important skills is you need to tell stories, learn to tell stories. This has practical implications. You think about an entrepreneur. On day zero, you have nothing. You have only an idea. I want to do this. You have no money, no employees, no product, no customers. So you start telling stories of what you want to do. And then the first idiot comes along and joins you. Then some investor gets convinced, gives you a little money. You build a product and you find the first customer who believes your story and will, willing. To. The storytelling is very important. And we don't learn that in most schools. I don't know if it's different here. We learn only test prep. That was the answer. Can we have some senior citizens, please? No, the young ones are doing amazingly well, which is incredibly <laughs> Is there something that you regret that you have done or not done? Yeah, I, I do get asked this question and I've thought about it. There's very little I regret. Um, if I do regret, because when I regret something, I try to change it. Okay? Oh, I never did this. I do it. And even now I'm trying new things. Or if I have a bad relationship. I go and fix it. Okay, I don't let things... But there's one thing that I perhaps regret that I can't change and turn the clock back is we chose not to have children. We got married late for my first and only time. We could have still probably had, had a kid. We didn't. And what I've learned about raising a child is it transforms you. Okay, and I... You know, there are lots of kids I'm fond of and I'm, you know, my... Little, so I don't miss... Ha the engagement with young people. I miss the complete commitment and devotion that it takes to raise a good child and the way in which it transforms you. I think I would have been a better or more complete person with that experience. Are there any questions? Yeah. Hi. And she, I know, I met her yesterday, we chatted and she said she's coming. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. And you are living evidence of that. Okay? I said it took me 10 years to write the book. The reason it was so hard is I decided I don't want to go and write this book by interviewing 20 people or 100 people and all that. Okay? Too much of that has been done. I also said the other problem is everything you, important or useful has been said hundreds and thousands of years ago. There's nothing new. The only thing new is the context. And so I decided I'm only going to speak my experience. Okay? And so you can disagree with it, but that's fine. 
but you can't argue that it is my truth. Okay? Yeah. So every single thing is based on my experience. Okay? Yeah. Now that doesn't mean I do everything consistently, but I do do it. And thank you for... But why did you ask that question? I was curious to know because so many experiences, so many references, so many different stories are in that book. Yeah. And when put together, it gets a bit... Heavy. Uh, yeah, it gets a bit he hectic when you read it. Yeah. So I wanted to know how much of it's actually true and how much can I keep aside for later use for myself or for okay. to tell others. Great question again. I would say this is not an easy read. Okay, it's not like reading a story or something. This is heavy. And my most important uh, intention is to get you to think. Okay? And if you think and say, I disagree with it, that's fine. Later on, you'll have an experience and then you'll think about it again. And at that point, it'll be useful. So I'll say, go through it and then stick it on your bookshelf. And then from time to time, I think you'll find it useful. Okay. But fabulous questions. I really admire you. Thank you so much. So I have two questions. Um, in your book, you talked about how we are right now in the fourth industrial revolution, and you talked about how so many new jobs were starting to open up. But all of these jobs require some level of education, right? You also gave a few examples. And you also talked about how so many jobs are replaced by AI, and these jobs that were being replaced, they were being secured by people who needed money the majority of the population who were not necessarily educated. So these new hard jobs can't really be done by the majority of the population who are poor and maybe a little bit. So what is your solution to that? No, this is the big conundrum of the, uh, the world today, that if you have hot skills and you're lucky to be born in the right place, life has never been better. So we are creating a lot of new jobs at the very top. And then we are creating a lot of jobs at the low level. The person who delivers the Amazon Flipkart package, the Swiggy Zomato food, the, uh, the nurse who is taking care of your wounds and the illnesses, whatever. We create frontline workers. There is nothing in between. Okay? That is the problem. And these are few, and that is many. So this is a very, very bad society. It results in a very skewed society. India is going that way. We're all saying India is shining. Who's it shining for? It's shining for 10% of the people. Okay? We've stopped with the escalator lifting people out of poverty. And it's not because Modi is a bad person. Okay? It's structural. If you replace Modi with me, it's going to be at least as bad. It's very deeply structural. And this is what happened after the first industrial revolution as well. It created lots of jobs, but it destroyed a generation of, of people. And after that, they export, very cleverly, the English exported the job losses to India. So the Brits got the new jobs, and the Indians lost the old jobs. All the textiles, etc., were decimated. So, look, I don't have a societal answer. I do have an answer for you, which is you can make sure you do the things I talked about. You will be fine, even if others around you. But this is a, one of the really fundamental challenges that society in every country faces. So, one more question. Um, you also talked about the scarcity mindset and the abundance mindset in your book. Yeah, scarcity. Uh, scarcity, sorry. Um, and you also sound like you favor the abundance mindset more and you suggest that all of us follow that mindset. But aren't there also drawbacks to having that mindset? Because isn't it like viewing the world through roast in the glasses? Isn't it like, so if you have that mindset, doesn't it mean that you're kind of ignoring what you don't have? Like, since you're only thinking, since you're thinking about what you have as enough, this You're not thinking about what you don't have and how to get what you don't have. Yeah. So did I understand that right? Or? I don't know. This is a, probably a question better addressed by Father. Um, 
because it deserves a sermon more than my answer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's, what is the scarcity mindset? Which is you believe there is only so much of something and you hold on to it like this. And that something could be money, that something could be time, it could be love, it could be um, your expertise, you know, your skills, knowledge, whatever. And I, the abundance mindset is you share without worry. There'll be more. You, you think there's enough. God has given enough. And even if I share, I won't run out of it. That's the mindset and belief. And I say that the abundance mindset is much better than the scarcity mindset. A, you're likely to be a happier person. And also, you tend to be more successful if you have an abundance mindset. Because if you hoard, you don't tend to build an ecosystem around you. Okay? So if you look at people with money, the ones who tend to share tend to have more impact and are happier people. And there's objective evidence of that versus those who hoard. I think the same can be said of other things. Are there drawbacks to it? I'm not aware of any. Uh, that doesn't prevent you. This is not inconsistent with saying, I need to go out and get more of this. Okay? Say you're a generous person. But you really don't have enough money. There's barely enough to eat. Okay? So you can, there's nothing inconsistent about going out and trying to make more money and still being generous. Okay? I don't think you should see these as either or. But I, I just totally believe a scarcity mindset. And I know this because I look, I have worked on my own scarcity mindset. Right now, for instance, where's that previous uh, young person who asked about, do you live what you practice? I've started practicing abundance on money, but I'm still very scarce when it comes to time, which is why partly it has taken six years to show up. Anyway, thank you. Should we wrap up? No, because I think some people who are getting, I've noticed, are getting a little fatigued. So we can continue more informally. Yes, sir. I'm Katie Chako. Uh, I used to work with the government and also have been a vice chancellor of sorts. And uh, my question, and I am, I have crossed the upper bandwidth which you mentioned of 50, 75. 50 okay. to 75. So probably not much of productive opportunity is left. But it's not a question about myself. The question I want to ask is that what you have uh, pictured in the talk is about um, the AI, with the arrival of the AI, and com you compared it with the various landmark which happened with the, uh, with the steam engine and also with the internet. We are at that crucial juncture. And if um, the working population, especially the young states of 20s, in their 20s and 30s, they are left with only one window of opportunity, largely, which is based on human capacity in terms of relationship building, uh, emotions, and, uh, uh, and probably uh, in that realm of human behavior that has a superiority over AI. Will it leave enough of margin in terms of opportunities for the vast population in that age group to do something really meaningful, unless probably they are able to invent something which controls the AI itself? It's a fantastic question. It's an existential question for all of humanity today. Uh, I don't think anybody, certainly I don't have the answer. If you ask me to guess, I would say no. There is not enough space and opportunity for the vast majority of people, which is why we have to come up with very radical solutions as countries. So one of the solutions is you put a heavy tax on the companies which are controlling and developing this because they're going to have windfall profits, okay? Like the East India Company, they will have monopolies. So you need, the governments need to tax them heavily and be able to provide many more basic services for free to all the population. So health, education, um, you know, transportation, all these things have to be 
a universal free service. You can't pri have those privatized. So certainly the Scandinavian countries are going in that direction. Even the US is thinking about it. You need to probably provide a universal basic income to everyone. Like your Mahatma Gandhi uh, and Rega scheme, you need to say, look, we are going to guarantee so many days of uh, employment so that you have at least some income, some dignity. But we also have, the, it's not just about money. People get so much from work beyond money. You get identity, right? You get satisfaction of doing something. You learn, you get to, how are we going to compensate for those things? This is why I think we're entering a very difficult uh, era. But human beings are also very adaptable. We've dealt with a lot of challenges and I'm sure you know, there will be lots of clever people, including those in the room, who come up with at least some of the solutions. But generally speaking, I think it's uh, going to be a challenging time for sure. But thank you. Yeah, I'm Vivek. Uh, I work as a programmer. So I've uh, been doing that for several years now. <laughs> so I also fall in this uh, 40 plus age group. So. Yeah, AI is uh, something that has come up over the last few uh, few months, uh, especially after chat GPT launch and people have been talking so much about uh, job loss. And I kind of sit in the middle of that because I'm a programmer and the first thing they say is programming jobs are going to be uh, uh, reduced uh, significantly. But I think the silver lining in the cloud is that uh, it's still uh, what I've experienced AI so far is that it's more of a force multiplier. Right? So if you are a programmer, it's just helping you to get your work done faster, which is good because I don't want to be working 12 hours a day. I want to work five hours or six hours a day, and I'm happy if I'm generating the same output. Perfect. Uh, so, so when people see that there's a problem with uh, AI taking over, but I see that there's a silver lining, and then there's a lot of collaboration when you go about writing a software. It's not that you give an instruction in one sentence and AI will develop it like. I've seen some uh, thoughts about it, saying that you give one instruction to it and it will build a website. So I just wanted to say, like, oh, uh, I because Chaco sir had come up with that point. No, I think there is still scope for humans. No, sir, thank you for broadening the discussion. First of all, I did. You're right. I agree with you. I did say, learn quickly to use it as a tool, because you plus AI will be better than you and you don't want to get replaced by somebody else with AI, okay? So I think we augment our capabilities in the way that you talk about as a developer yeah. uh, by using AI. So that's a very important statement. The second thing is, I, in my book, I talk about this uh, project at Google where they looked at who are the most successful Googlers, and they found that collaboration is critical. Yeah. Uh, and so the most successful ones were those not just purely technical, but were able to lead, collaborate, etc. So the human, augmented human being, you still need the human being. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's it for us. <laughs> that, so that is also a very good point. The third thing is, we dwelt a little bit on the ch too much maybe on the challenges, but it also is going to enable amazing things. So one of my mentees is uh, a young woman called Supriya. Uh, she runs an organization called Agami which is focusing on improvements to the judicial system. So they have created two AI uh, use cases. One is a lot of people have legal questions and they don't know where to get it answered and that too in non-English languages. So they've created a chatbot with a verticalized use case which is it's a wonderful demo. So you can do things like this. The second thing is India has a backlog of some two crore cases, which is why every everything is delayed in the judiciary. So part of how we get through this, they've built a uh, legal assistant for judges, okay? So you can dramatically improve their productivity or maybe it can actually go through that huge stack of cases and at least divide it into uh, piles and you can dispose of this quickly. So there are all kinds. Nandan Nilakini's team has developed this uh, chatbot called Jugalbandi which is able to uh, look at government schemes and policies and respond to your queries in your local language. 
So there are going to be amazing, amazing things that AI will enable, which are also good. It's not all dark and bleak and so forth. Maybe I came across too much in that fashion. So I thank you for helping us end on a positive note. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George Curry is uh, one year junior to George Curry. Oh, from the school. From the school. Oh, wonderful. How do you subscribe to the, there's a book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where they're saying the children of richer kids, uh, of richer dads are more successful and children of the less privileged are less successful. How do you subscribe to that? Uh, I think it's a huge advantage that, uh, you know, wealthy kids enjoy. It is not a level playing field. Even in the U.S., which prides itself on a meritocracy, now the evidence says it's anything but a meritocracy. Uh, one third of the kids being admitted to the elite institutions are kids of alumni. Okay, it starts from uh, you know early childhood, nutrition. You know what do you have access to? What are you exposed to? So it's a giant advantage to be born into at least some level of affluence. Um, but at the same time, there is a inverse bathtub effect where the children of super rich parents are doomed. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, it's, yeah, I think that the understanding of poverty is now very robust. Um, we know why it exists. And there's a beautiful book by Anirudh, Anirudh, some professor, uh, I forget, it's called Broken Ladder. And it, it, he points out how if you're born into poverty, it is so exceedingly hard to climb out of it. Okay? And you keep falling back into it. Fantastic book for anybody who's interested in understanding um, poverty. Thank you.